A huge thanks to Dawn for leading us in our time of prayer and to Ashley for reading the passage before us. John chapter 3, 1 to 15. I'm going to pray and then we will study this passage together. Let's pray. Gracious God, I ask that by that great power of the Holy Spirit, you would open our eyes to see the truth of your ways. Help us to see the Lord Jesus rightly. Help us to see him in all his glory and wonder and power. And kneel, and may we kneel before him as a result. In Jesus' name. Amen. You might be forgiven for thinking that the National Church's biggest concern in this current time was health and safety. Certainly the Church of England's response to the national guidelines was to actually go further than had been recommended or advised. Every building was closed and the reason given was health and safety. While it has been right to uphold the government's recommendations and also to be publicly supporting those key workers, what a tragedy that the national church leaders haven't put front and centre the very greatest need of all, the salvation of our souls. You see, there is a killer disease that has already swept the whole world, but... There is also a foolproof vaccine already available for us. And it is the church's prime, primary responsibility to tell the world about this foolproof vaccine for this universal killer disease. And this passage today explains both the disease and the vaccine. This passage defines Christianity like a spirit level it measures, which measures something that is flat, or a plumb line that shows something that is absolutely upright. This passage shows us what the very core of Christianity is all about. We're left in no doubt after we've looked at these verses. So if you are a Christian, or you may have just become one, or you may have been, may be a Christian, have been a Christian for many, many years, this is an MOT for you. But if you're looking in, and this, if you're looking in and just seeing what we're about, this is what the Christian faith is all about. You may have been told that it's about this or that. Well, this is what Jesus says Christianity is all about. That's what we'll discover in these verses. Let's have a look at the narrative, this story, and see what is happening in the discussion between this man Nicodemus and Jesus. I've got three things for us to, uh, to, to understand. First, Nicodemus longed for a better world, and so do we. That's what we can find in the first two verses. Nicodemus is a very important person, a significant man in society. He is, he is a Pharisee. He, is devote, he has devoted his life to religion. He is a member of the Jewish ruling council. And Jesus says he is Israel's teacher. He is something like a, a bishop, an MP and a professor all rolled into one. I would imagine that his mother would have been very, very proud of him. Nicodemus, though, longed for a better world. He saw the oppression, he saw the injustice, he saw the sickness and the suffering, and he longed for something to happen. And my guess is that will reflect the desires and aspirations of each and every one of us, whether ourselves or for others. And Nicodemus, Nicodemus though, had a bit more information than we did. He longs for the kingdom purely and simply because he knows how good it will be. He knows that his God will bring all, the, all things back under his rule. And it's not a plan to oppress people and beat them down. No, to set them free. That's what God is going to do. His plan is to set us free. 
So as he makes his way through the streets of Jerusalem to go and find Jesus, it is this prospect that quickens his step to find him. You see, he knew that God had promised a king who would heal the sick, give sight to the blind and make the lame walk. These were the kind of miracles that Jesus was, was uh, performing. They weren't party tricks to impress the crowd. They were signs to something else. He was beginning to see where these signs were pointing. Here was Jesus putting broken lives back together again. Could he be the one? That's what this man Nicodemus is saying in verse 2. Let me read it to you. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miracle signs you are doing if God were not with him. Nicodemus longed for something better. Secondly, Nicodemus needed a fresh start, and so do we. Notice that he comes to Jesus in the night. There are many different explanations for this, but in keeping with how John writes, I think he is wanting us to see that Nicodemus is, for all his knowledge and understanding, in the dark about, uh, about how to be part of this wonderful new kingdom, this kingdom of God. In effect, he's saying, from my reading of the Old Testament, he says, I know the sign to look for, are you who I think you are? If you are, tell me how I can get into this kingdom, says Nicodemus. And it's crunch time. What will Jesus say? How will he respond to Nicodemus? Well, beautifully and wonderfully, he starts, I tell you the truth. Isn't that brilliant? We can have absolute confidence that what we're about to get is true. Let me read to you what Jesus says. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Nicodemus, I think, then would, is replying, isn't he, in verse 4, he is, Nicodemus is saying, I'm coming you with questions about life and how to get into the kingdom, Jesus, and you tease me with riddles. But verses 5 to 8, Jesus, you see, isn't messing around. He is telling Nicodemus and you and me we need a miracle. You see, flesh give, gives birth to flesh. We know that with the, 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 a newborn baby. It's a miracle, but it's flesh giving birth to flesh. But the Holy Spirit gives birth to the Spirit, gives birth to Spirit. We need another miracle to happen for us to be right with God. That's what Jesus is saying. Uh, imagine for a moment I'm uh, uh, channel hopping on the telly and ballet comes up. It's Swan Lake. It's memorising. It's brilliant. And I'm hooked. I've got to become a ballet dancer, I say to myself. And off I go for an audition at the Royal Ballet School. Now, I know you'll laugh at that, but just imagine. I go for the audition. I come back. And uh, I wait for the letter and the letter finally arrives. And this is what it says. Dear Mr. Leggett, we regret to inform you that you, we are unable to offer a place for you here. We feel that it is, on, it is only fair to advise you at the outset that it is our considered opinion that your only hope of a career in ballet is if you were born again. What are they saying? They are not saying, Mr. Leggett, if you practice day and night and on your pirouettes, then you, we will give you a place. No, what they are saying is this, Mr. Leggett, you're too old, you're too fat and you have no coordination. You haven't a hope of being a ballet dancer. You have no ability, no potential and your only hope is that, you're, that you are born again. Jesus says... We must be born again. You need a completely new start. And we look at Nicodemus, who was a good guy. He was, an, he was honest and sincere. 
He looked out for other people. He took God seriously. And you may be thinking to yourself, if God, Nicodemus isn't good enough, then who is? What hope is there for any of the rest of us? And if we're really honest with ourselves, we long to be better people, don't we, than we are? We long to be better spouses, better friends, better parents. But there is a great big gap between what we long for and what we really are. We wish we weren't so bitter, but we can't move on. We say things we wish we hadn't said. We do things that we regret immediately. We keep hurting the ones we love most. However hard we try, we just can't change. In fact, often, the harder we try to change, the more difficult it becomes. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a shattering thought, that it is just, that it is uh, not just that we won't change our ways, but we can't. It really hurts, but it's true. And then we come to verses 8 to 15. And we have this, the foolproof vaccine that God provides. You see, this miracle, this new birth, is something we can't do. That's what he's saying in verse 8, isn't it? Verse 8, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You see, we can, we can tell when the wind is blowing, leaves rustle, hats blow off, shutters slam, but we can't make it happen. There's nothing we can do to make the, blow, the wind blow or stop blowing. See, we do not get into the kingdom of God because we are better than anyone else. You get in because God has done something to you. He has performed this miracle in you. Now, this is really important for us to grasp grasp for as long as you think you could be good enough and this disease is not too bad and with the right sort of effort and the right surroundings you can kill it you could master it well you'll never get there if you think that way God has to do it in you it is what John's John 1 and 2 these first two chapters that we've looked at are all about it is all about God coming to us how is it possible that we might be born again for the breath of God to sweep through our lives how can that happen verses 14 and 15 he tells us just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life God has done something he has acted for us he has sent his son to be lifted up that is of course die on the cross as Moses lifted the serpent in the wilderness Jesus will be lifted up on the cross to die you see the people in Moses's time were grumbling against God they were telling him that he had got it all wrong just like we do today and God sent venomous snakes who bit the people and many died. But they came to Moses and they pleaded with him to plead with God. He told them to make a snake and put it on a pole. Whoever is bitten, God declares, who then looks at the pole will live. God in his great love sent Jesus, his only son, to be lifted up on the cross to die for us. Anyone who believes that to be true has eternal life. They are born again. Jesus tells Nicodemus that is the only way. For the Christian here, that is the only grounds for our confidence. I look to Jesus, lift it up for me, and I trust him that what he says about his death is true. My sins can be forgiven. Now, there will be those who are watching uh, today for whom this is all new. What is all this about? Well, it is 
I can't put it any more simply than Jesus does, can I? You must be born again. That's what he's saying. He says you must be born again. Verse 15, he says that everyone who believes in him, in other words, in him who goes to the cross and what that meant will have eternal life. At the beginning, I said there is a killer disease that has already swept the whole world and you and I have it. But this is the amazing truth. This is why God has come into the world. He has brought with him in the person of Jesus the foolproof vaccine and it is available today. You see, you don't need an app. You don't need to go into quarantine. You just need to look to Jesus on, and Jesus on the cross and say to yourself, thank you that on the cross you died for my sin. I believe that I am healed of the killer disease of my sin because of Jesus hanging on the cross. Let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that with great clarity you see our greatest need. Open our eyes to see that we need to be born again by your Holy Spirit and have eyes to see Jesus lifted up on the cross in our place. Today, help us to say thank you and I believe that you might save some today. Amen. Well, we're going to sing one more song now, and it's a great song that expresses all the truths that we've been looking at, Man of Sorrows.